Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Kate Heron. I'm an associate at Urban Initiatives and a landscape architect and with a background in horticulture. So I see my role in this context of uh, basically presenting you with horticulture for beginners. Um, and it really takes off from where Gary left off in talking about the below ground situation. However, I don't claim to be an expert, but th these are the sorts of things that I think engineers really need to know in order to create best practice. So the intrinsic benefits of trees. So this slide shows a pretty iconic element of the Carlton landscape that you're probably, hopefully, all familiar with. And that's because trees are the dominant component in urban landscapes. And trees are important to people, and they symbolise personal, local, community, and cultural meanings. So this takes me back to university, but there's also you know, a connection to the history of the place in terms of who designed the original um, college at the University of Melbourne, but to someone else it might have completely different meaning, or they might just appreciate it for the trees alone. But one of the most effective ways of improving the urban environment is to plant trees. So designing for trees, why should we care? Why is it that we end up with these scenarios? Why are trees and green space treated as a bolt-on or nice to have last addition, as described in the 2020 vision? Trees are removed for all sorts of reasons, including damaging pavement, because it's easier and cheaper to remove a tree than design for the life of a tree. But as we move to a hotter and drier climate, a tree should be considered just as important. Why aren't we designing for the trees? What type of tree are we designing for? Are we even designing for trees? This, this presentation is about trees, but if you're not designing for trees, what sort of landscape do you want to provide? That's kind of a separate conversation and not one I can really cover here. So this is all about the money money. Services of trees. Oops, sorry. Urban forests provide critical ecosystem services, such as air and water filtration, shade, habitat, oxygen, carbon sequestration, and nutrient cycling. More trees and vegetation increase amenity, livability, property value, and they'll also make people spend more money when they're visiting a well-treed landscape, such as in a shopping mall. So the city of Melbourne, from their urban forestry, or urban forest strategy estimates that the amenity value, which is the characteristics that make them attractive to us for use, such as shade, ornament, or other purposes, at around $700 million. So that's a huge amount of value just from an aesthetic pers perspective. And it's also important to consider that urban forests also support a wide range of species, including in endangered animals. So there's some, some numbers up there for you, and I won't belabor the point, but in a study of 982 trees, trees have the capacity to remove a huge amount of pollution at a significant dollar benefit. They can also store carbon at a significant dollar benefit, and they can also save in energy costs. And that's through shading buildings in summer and providing solar access in winter. So just some of the benefits of trees, and I won't, again, belabor the point. Um, this graphic pretty much says everything that I need to say. But some of the other really important reasons we want trees in landscapes is uh, to reconnect our children with nature. It's improving mental well well-being. And, you know, it does create a sense of place and a city identity. All those other things, the green things particularly, will probably be of more interest to you. So in a climate emergency, what are we going to do? So we need to mitigate the urban heat island effect, and we do that by reducing day and nighttime temperatures, especially in summer. And as Chris explained, the transpiration effect, which draws soil 
uh, sorry, more moisture from the soil and releases moisture into the air is really important because the effect of transpiration plus the combination of shade of trees actually helps reduce temperatures by up to 20 degrees on a hot summer day. And why is that important? Because in Melbourne, on a day over 30 degrees Celsius, we substantially increase the risk of death and illness for anyone over 64 years of age. The risk increases significantly. And people in buildings with little or no surrounding vegetation have a higher risk of heat-related illness too. And as you all know, I'm preaching to the converted that tree canopies and root systems reduce stormwater flows and nutrient loads that end up in our waterways. So this next section is about what trees need. And we've already touched on this a little bit, but I just want to go into a bit more detail because I think this is where engineers just don't understand what trees actually do need. Some engineers do. What's important to know about tree roots is that 99% of all the roots grow in the top surface of the soil, within 90 centimetres usually. When you're talking about a nursery grown tree, so a small tree that you're about to install, most of the fine roots are in the top 45 centimetres of soil. And what's important about the fine roots is that they're the ones that are responsible for taking up water and the gaseous exchange in the soil. Tap roots are an urban myth. So please let go of that outdated notion. They're basically aborted or missing entirely in the urban environments and usually at a depth of around 50 centimetres. What's important to note about this also is that a tree that has established a shallower root system is vulnerable. It's less well anchored into the soil, so it's structurally vulnerable to high winds and storm events, more of which we're going to see in the climate emergency. I'll talk a little bit more about the fine roots in a moment, but that just gives you a, a brief overview. So this is why soil volume matters. Because in a tree grown in an open space where there's no constraints like curbs or services, the tree, tree roots are mostly lateral roots and they're fairly evenly distributed around the trunk in a radial pattern. And the uh, tree roots can spread up to three times the diameter of the canopy. So that drip line notion, it's kind of true, but also kind of not. And the shallow system is typically shallower the further it is away from the trunk. And again, why we're all here is how can we possibly get more water to a tree? And here's why that's important. We all know it's important, but why is it important? Without an adequate amount of irrigation, a newly planted tree will have dieback, which is indicated on the far left there with those dashed lines. In two years' time, if it hasn't already been killed completely, new shoots will grow from those remaining branches. And then five years after that, what we'll end up with is a structurally poor tree. So aesthetically, it doesn't look great, but it actually also has some pretty major ongoing maintenance issues with structural pruning and it could just be a really bad structurally structural tree. The difference with irrigation is pretty substantial and obviously well known. If you supply a quality tree, and that's sometimes half the battle in my industry, Two years later, the twigs will remain alive, and five years later, you'll have a great tree with a central leader. That means less ongoing pruning, fewer stability or anchorage issues, and it's also less susceptible to pest and disease attack. These, again, become even more important with the climate emergency. It's also important to note that where to irrigate, irrigate is just as important as how much or how often, and of course, Having minimum soil volumes is, is the first step, but actually when you've planted a new tree, what you need in the, at least the first two years is to get all of that water directed to the top of the root ball from the original nursery pot. And that's so that these fine roots can develop. So you can see in this slide, it's pretty clear the difference between 
a scenario in a nursery with no irrigation, which is on the far left, a situation where there's irrigation to both inside and outside the root ball on the far right, but in the middle, the sweet spot or the Goldilocks spot, if you'd like to think of it that way, it encourages the proliferation of these fine roots in the so-called easy soil first, and then th over the longer term, then we'll get those lateral roots moving out from that pot soil and into the surrounding soil. So arguably, maybe the image on the right produces a more long-term drought tolerant tree because it's actually getting that root extension out into the surrounding areas sooner, but it can also actually slow the establishment time. So it's kind of a bit of a balance. This is about what to avoid and pretty much the number one issue to avoid, but it's also inevitable in urban areas is compaction. So it's actually the compaction that's the greatest limitation to tree survival, health and success in urban environments. Now, to get technical on you, bulk density is an indicator of soil compaction and it's measured in grams per cubic centimetre. I'm not going to give you that again because I'll stumble over it and say rude words. But bulk density is greater than 1.6 tend to restrict root growth. What's less clear is that the critical value of bulk density that restricts root growth varies in soil types, but it's also not quite that clear cut. And this is where sci soil scientists can really help you and getting t soil testing can really help you. So in sandy soils, they're actually the most vulnerable to compaction because they have larger but fewer pore spaces and they can have higher bulk densities at between 1.3 and 1.7. Clay soils can sometimes have a good soil structure, better than sandy soils, and that's because there's a greater amount of pore space and the particles are really small. So there's many small spaces in between all those little small pieces of soil. It's really hard to get a really good image of soil, by the way. Um, so, and then soils in high in organic matter like peat which we don't really have here, but they can have um, densities of less than 0.5 of a gram. So it's a pretty significant argument, more on that later, about why increasing the amount of organic matter in the soil can be a really good thing. So this slide demonstrates what can happen if you don't get those really good trees from the nursery in the first place. And this is a pretty key step in any of your installations and hopefully when you're all working with landscape architects or other design professionals, they'll make sure that you don't get trees delivered to site like this because otherwise your project is doomed from the start. So the gases diffuse through the pores and the voids in the soil. So there's really tiny gaps I was talking about earlier. What compaction does is squish them all together and that actually reduces the amount of pore space and therefore the gassy exchange rates. Now that also prevents water from uptake as well. So this also reduces the depth at which roots effectively function. So you get shallow root systems. So that's problematic like I mentioned before because you, know, you get really poor anchorage and possibly less um, resilient trees. And a deep application of mulch to the top of a tree root ball and soils that have excessive amounts of organic matter at depth can also have a similar effect of compaction in that they reduce this gaseous, gaseous exchange. So the, the displacement of the air, the oxygen and other gaseous materials and the water that they need to grow. Now, one hot tip from me as a landscape architect is that um, the outward symptoms of drought and water logging can appear exactly the same wilting. So if you see wilting, don't assume that it's a drought condition. Do more investigation because if you end up with waterlogged soil, it will result in the death of the tree. So this is a pretty um, shocking image, but it does demonstrate why it's really important to get a good tree with good root systems in an area that has enough soil or rooting volume. So the trees that are most prone to failure are those where there's poor drainage combined with increased runoff, which leads to a wet soil 
and that creates shallow or insufficient root systems. And that's pretty much what you're effectively trying to do when you build these systems. So that's why, going back to that soil volume, it's imperative you get that right. In retrospect, you can kind of see why this was bound to happen. I mean, that nature strip is what, 800 mil wide, and they're what I would consider very large trees, which contribute a huge amount to the streetscape amenity. But, you know, if we're planning for trees, if we're designing for trees, was that really the best choice for that streetscape, or why didn't we give them more space in the first place? Or why didn't we act sooner before this you know, major storm event made all of them keel over. I'm sorry, sorry to burst your bubble engineers, but root control barriers don't really work. So root barriers are there and they're designed to prolong the life of your adjacent structures. They're typically installed parallel to your structure, but they're not the solution you think they are. What they can re reduce is damage in the short term. But in the long term, hopefully after everyone's forgotten we've worked on the project, they will actually grow back up and damage your infrastructure. And it just it's a nature of the soil type as to how quickly that might happen. So this section is about you know, continuing on what to avoid, but it's important to note, and Gary touched on this earlier too, that not all trees are compatible for every planting site or in every climate. Tree selection and placement are two of the most important decisions you can make when planting trees. Trees should outlive those of us who plant them, and the impact should be lasting lifetimes. Removing and replacing poorly chosen trees is difficult, but we need to get better at this because historically, we've actually done a really bad job at designing for trees. The greatest benefit is derived from healthy, structurally sound trees planted in the right place that supports their development. And this is where the mantra, the right tree in the right place comes from. And if, if you're a landscape architect, I hope you live by that creed. In fact, we should all be living by that creed. But importantly, it maximises the benefits while minimising the costs. So short-term thinking, which we do a lot of because it's convenient and cheap. So we design the site so that the roots remain in a tiny little cutout. The tree grows slowly, doesn't grow very big, might die, probably gets replaced within five or 10 years, but your beautiful, beautiful curb and road is remaining intact. So it's inexpensive, but you know you're gonna to have to replace the tree in five or 10 years, but they're really not gonna contribute these trees. They're not gonna to contribute to a significant streetscape. They're not gonna contribute much of that shade that's gonna be so important as we move to the climate emergency. And it's pretty much a poor investment because you don't get much for your money, but arguably it's still better than nothing. So, but we can certainly do better. So the medium term view, and I think this is where most of the people in this room are sort of hedging their bets. <laughs> uh, it's to design the site so that the roots grow out of the soil in the cutout and into the soil surrounding it. The tree grows well, pretty healthy, but you know there are associated problems with the infrastructure. It's a larger initial cost, and there's usually recurring costs associated with fixing that in infrastructure when damage inevitably occurs. However, the community benefits, the amenity benefits are significant. The tree grows well, becomes large, provides significant shade, but yeah, those, those infrastructure issues remain. So is adjusting the infrastructure better than removing the tree? Probably, and, but is this, in this instance, the right tree given the obvious soil and root volume constraints? And that's, again, a historical problem that we're facing today and into the future. So if we were to start again, would we do it differently? Hopefully the answer is yes. So wouldn't it be nice if all our trees and all our streets had the opportunity that this tree does? It's basically given adequate soil volume for the chosen tree species. It's got the biggest initial cost, but there's really not many ongoing costs. So the tree is growing well, it's healthy, the pavement's intact, 
and really there's huge community benefits and I can foresee that this tree will be able to live as long as a life as it should. So we're all here because we want to learn from each other, but what I encourage you to do is collaborate and talk more, because we need to educate the decision makers. We're the ones on the ground doing the hard yards, but really it's the decision makers and the short term thinkers that live by a political cycle that are the problem in my view. It's problematic if we think of trees only in the terms of services, benefits and values from an economic or capitalist paradigm. There are those intrinsic values that are so important. But I do argue to use the tools at your disposal and customise the arguments of, the, of those decision makers that you're trying to convince. There's no shortage of evidence, as you've heard already. But if your audience is driven by an economic argument, as much as I think that's problematic, definitely lead with that. Don't lose sight of the opportunity to educate beyond their field of vision. And if you, we collaborate with others, others often and early in built form professionals, engineers, wussed designers, arborists, horticulturists, and some of the, I think, unsung heroes of the urban environment, the soil scientists, I think we'll all end up with much better outcomes. <laughs>